forthcoming. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Thanks very much, Rebecca Foster. Welcome to uh, Wednesday's Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. I hope you're having a good weekend. Weekend? Hope you're having a good week. Week, that's more like it. That's wishful thinking. Weekends, eh? Yes, we're a while away from the weekend. Welcome to the programme. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, that's a proper wishful thinking there. You're thinking about the weekend already. It's Wednesday, July 21st, 2020. Thanks for joining the program. Uh, two terrific guests, as usual, lined up for you today. Simon Dolan, the businessman who attempted to take the UK government to court, to the High Court, to challenge the legality of the lockdown. Simon returns to the program. Uh, he's a friend of the programs now, I suppose. And in the second hour, I'm looking forward to chatting to the social and political commentator, Fiona Marie Flanagan, an academic and a really interesting lady whom I've come across on social media. Uh, she's made some blindingly brilliant videos about the changing face of Ireland, about COVID, about climate change, and much more. So Fiona Marie Flanagan joins the program in the second hour. There you are. Not too bad today. Well, very good today, I think. Looking forward to ch- catching up with uh, Fiona Marie Flanagan as she's not been on this programme before and it's somebody whom I've wanted to have on the programme. So there you are then. Tweet me as usual. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Russia. Yes, ministers. Very interesting this. Considering strengthening security laws here in the UK after that report by MPs accused them the government of underestimating the threat of Russian interference. Now, Home Office Minister James Brokenshire said foreign agents could be required to register in the UK in future. He said that other new offences and powers for dealing with foreign spies were being looked at. Labour's uh, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, accused the government of complacency and leaving a serious gap in the UK's defences. Prime Minister's questions took place today. There, Starmer said the government delayed legislation to help counter Russian interference, despite acknowledging nearly two years ago that existing uh, powers were insufficient. You can hear Keir Starmer first, and then Boris Johnson, today's PMQs. Under my leadership, national security will always be the top priority for Labour. So I want to ask the Prime Minister about the extremely serious report by the Intelligence and Security uh, Committee. It concludes that Russia poses an immediate and urgent threat to our national security and is engaged in a range of activities that include espionage, interfering in democratic processes and serious crime. The Prime Minister received that report ten months ago. Given that the threat is described as immediate and urgent, why on earth did the Prime Minister sit on that report for so long? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, actually when I was uh, Foreign Secretary for the period that I've been in office, we've been taking the strongest possible action against Russian uh, wrongdoing, orchestrating, I seem to remember, the expulsion of 130 Russian diplomats, 153 Russian diplomats around the world, while the Right Honourable Gentleman opposite sat on his hands and said nothing, while the Labour Party parroted the line of the Kremlin when people in this country were poisoned at the orders of Vladimir Putin. Mr Speaker, I stood up and condemned what happened in Salisbury and uh, and the Prime Minister, I supported the then Prime Minister on record. So I'd ask the Prime Minister to check the record and withdraw that. Mr Speaker, I I really don't. I think the uh, right honourable gentleman's questions are absolutely absurd. There is no country in the Western world that is more vigilant in protecting the interests of this country or the international community from Russian interference. Yeah, it's all a puppet show. I don't need to tell you that. If you look at them both... It's a bit back to the future. Starmer Johnson, Blair Cameron, Major Blair. It's the illusion of choice, isn't it? Speaking of the Labour Party, it has agreed to give substantial damages to seven former employees who sued the party in this never-ending saga 
about anti-Semitism. You remember the Panorama programme last year. The party, Labour, has issued an unreserved apology in the High Court for making false and defamatory comments about these alleged whistleblowers. Now, back in July of last year, the Panorama programme, which was called Is Labour Anti-Semitic? It, that programme basically showed or displayed or featured a number of former party officials. And those former party officials alleged that senior figures close to Corbyn at the time interfered in the process of dealing with anti-Semitism complaints. They also claimed they faced a huge increase in complaints since Jeremy Corbyn became leader in 2015. At the time, Labour said these were disaffected former staff who had personal and political access to grind. And they were accused, were these whistleblowers, of trying to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. Now today, Corbyn said the decision to settle the claims with an apology and damages was disappointing. He said the party's legal advice was that it had a strong defence. He was echoed, was Corbyn, by union leader Len McCluskey. We can hear from the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy, from Wigan, Lisa Nandy. Here's Lisa Nandy speaking to BBC Politics Today. She's overjoyed that we can put this anti-Semitism behind us. Well, I just really welcome this. I was one of the very many people in the Labour Party who spoke out um, about the treatment of those whistleblowers. Um, and I think this is a welcome step forward that shows that Labour is now taking this seriously um, and um, it, justice is being done. We've, we've acknowledged that we got it wrong. That is the right thing to do. And we're taking steps today to set it right. Not everyone um, on the left agrees with you. I, I think we can show our viewers this tweet from Len McCluskey, General Secretary of the Unite Union. Um, he says today's settlement is a misuse of Labour Party funds. It could be in the region of £200,000. To settle a case, it was advised we could win in court. We would win in court. The leaked report on how anti-Semitism was handled tells a very different story about what happened. What do you say to that? Yeah. Powerful stuff from Len McCluskey. That. Well, I would just mm. say that, that I believe that Len is completely wrong. Well, you've got to say that, love. No career in politics for you if you disagree, uh, if you agree with him. And you, you disagree with these whistleblowers who, who had no evidence, really, that there was any interference in any anti-Semitism investigation. But, of course, your career is ruined if you don't stand alongside the Zionist element of uh, UK lobbyists in in in, uh, in Westminster, you've got to say, oh, it's terrible, yeah, yeah, and I'm delighted that we've uh, given these people money. Otherwise, you're finished, Lisa. About that. And that's, that's how it works. And that the way that a number of Labour Party staff, some very long-standing, some very young um, and, and, and new, who has... Yeah, 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 yeah. These allegations were baseless, without any foundation whatsoever, and they were solely, only to destroy and bring down Jeremy Corbyn. Whom I, as you well know, have no time for whatsoever. No Labour supporter am I. Anyway, Lisa Nandy there. We'll leave that one there. We're fed up with that. Uh, Cressida Dick, old Cressida, is the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. I know, I know. Um, what do I know? I'm not telling you. She was on Nick Ferrari's programme on LBC Radio. Why? Well, because every now and then she pops on to answer questions about policing in the capital and what have you. So Cressida Dick was on there and there were some interesting questions, lots of them in fact. Here's uh, one or two of them. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll deal with one and then we'll, 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 we'll jog on because we've lots to get through. This Friday, two days from now, masks come into play in UK shopping areas, shops, shopping centres and what have you. We are supposed to be wearing a mask when we enter shops this coming weekend. Now, some police forces, including Sam's Valley Police, have said we won't be enforcing it. We don't have the manpower. Right. Anyway, you see, we're wearing masks in July, you see. They're asking us to wear masks in July because the virus is still around, you see. There's loads of virus around and, well, loads of infections and, well, we, we need to keep socially distanced and we need to stay away from one another and not hug our grandparents and all of that. You know, eh? What do you think of that, eh? Yeah, right. Dry that one out, you can fertilise the lawn. Yeah, and we won't ever return to normal, ever, until we get a vaccine. Vaccines will be our saving grace. They will save our lives and help us to return to normal. 
because vaccines will give us herd immunity, eh? Yeah, right. Dry that one out, you can fertilise the lawn. Mm, it is bullshit, but it's happening and there isn't anything I see that's going to stop it. So police then, a crest of a dick, what's happening with the masks? Let's talk about enforcement. Will you enforce mask wearing? Will you be out there in shops finding people? Here is the Met Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick. So our, our approach to the regulations, as you know, has been um, throughout to only use enforcement as a last resort. Uh, so when people were, you know, only highly restricted on being able to go out on the streets, we were out uh, and we were just talking to people and encouraging them to comply. And the vast, vast, vast majority of people did comply. As I understand, the vast majority of people are now complying with wearing the masks on public transport. And this is the most important thing, that people... Uh, actually Actually, a do comply, and that other people encourage people to comply. Do you want to educate feel, and explain? Yeah, absolutely. Initially. This yeah. is ma- much the enforce? most important will thing. You, if I'm well, running a shop and I've got I, half a dozen people and I call, will your men and women we, come? We running? would. We will be working when we are with the retail trade right across London, and and um, just as again during the beginning of lockdown, the larger stores that were open, you remember the supermarkets and things were open. Uh, some of them brought in literally security guards, yes. but they did maintain. They have been able to maintain the social distancing and the sensible queuing and all that kind of thing. And they've only we, we patrol around and 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 speak to the shops, but they've only called us rarely to assist. And that is what I hope would happen on this occasion. Pol- the, calling the police should be a last a resort for dealing with a, a mask issue uh, but of course you know the law What's is the issue? law sorry a mask in a shop you know having yeah, to wear if, a face covering in a but shop if someone's not but, wearing their mask and 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 they refuse and, you do i ring the police I, th- I i well i would say if you've tried everything and you're really concerned you can't get the person out of the store uh, and you and you know they're getting aggressive or whatever yes of course you should you should but ring the police they get but, aggressive. well I, I think people will. How my, helpful my, is this <laughs> my hope is that the vast majority of people will comply, Indeed. and that people who are not complying will be shamed into complying or shamed to leave the store by yeah. by the storekeepers. By the storekeepers, you'll be shamed into complying by the storekeepers. Imagine that you'll have the. Do they call it the Tanoi system anymore? Probably not. That's very old fashioned. You know, you'll have shop managers. Supermarket managers, look at the arsehole on aisle 10 walking around without a mask, eh? Putting you at risk, eh? Eh? Incredible stuff, this. And I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen over the weekend. I don't know whether people will 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 just acquiesce, whether they will bow their heads and say, all right, well, there isn't anything we can do about it, so we'll wear our masks and we'll see how we get on. I don't know what's going to happen. I won't be wearing a mask. I will be entering supermarkets. Yes, I do accept and I I do acknowledge that as somebody who has been diagnosed with asthma and who does carry an inhaler, if push came to shove, I suppose I could brandish it rather than end up rolling around the floor punching a supermarket manager in the face. We'll have to wait and see what's going to happen. I was listening to talk radio earlier on today and very interesting little bit of commentary from Neil Oliver. Now, Neil Oliver is an archaeologist and a broadcaster, and he's a very interesting guy, is Neil Oliver. He was on Mike Graham's programme, and Oliver was lamenting how utterly impotent comedy is in 2020, and he was also musing about self-censorship. And the chap, Neil Oliver, is very eloquent. This is stark stuff. Have a listen to what he says. Uh, And people are being terribly careful not to not to say the wrong word, just to trot out dogma, uh, just to say the things that they think will get them the pass to the, you know, to the rest of their lives and to be able to go about a business unmolested. Mm. Uh, and and part, there's definitely been a lack of humour. You know, the, the, what passes for comedy on, on mainstream television at the moment, I would say, is, is risible in, in the very worst sense of the word. It's, it's pompous, censorious sermons uh, sneering at, 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 uh, at various sections of, of the society. Uh, I don't feel inclined to laugh about it. I've, I've found that I've had to go mining for contraband, uh, you know, on YouTube mm. and, and other platforms, looking for the humour of the past. You mentioned uh, Billy Connolly. Yeah. You, you know, for me, partly probably because of my upbringing and, and whatever. I, I, I revere <laughs> Connolly as, as one of the funniest uh, human beings ever to draw breath. Yeah. Uh, but I've gone back looking for, you know, you know, Bill Hicks, uh, Robin Williams, uh, Chris Rock, yeah. because I'm in, I'm in desperate need of the irreverence. 
I'm in desperate need of it. It's, it's like taking illicit drugs or something. Yes. You know, going back and hearing someone, even just 10 years ago, uh, having the, the audacity uh, you know, to say the unsayable, because that's where we are now. Yeah. You know, the unsayable is definitely there. Pretty soon, it will be you'll be caught out for thinking the unthinkable. Yes. Yeah, it's according to a lot of people like him. Maybe it wouldn't have occurred to him before COVID. It's encouraged, it is... It is dawning on people like him what is happening to their world, to their friends and family, and they don't like it, and they're speaking out about it. Is it too late? I don't know. Let me tell you this very briefly. I put a post on Facebook earlier on today. I've known a couple of guys who've worked for Google. In fact, I know three guys, two who worked for Google, and one guy who left Google and who came on this program to talk with me uh, a year and a half ago about Google censorship against alternative right platforms. And my two mates who work at Google, both of them still there, they've dropped me one or two bits of information over uh, the years. Nothing groundbreaking, really. Just little bits of information about things that are happening there. And I was in touch with one of them this morning. And he said to me, look, you need to have a heads up on what's been happening around the COVID virus and the COVID vaccine. And he said to me, before a COVID vaccine is ready, it's already been decided by Google, YouTube. Uh, Google owns YouTube. That's a dreadful thing in and of itself. I talked about that many, many times on the programme. They have decided that they're going to take down thousands, possibly tens of thousands of channels around about the time that the vaccine is ready to go. And allegedly, they're going to do this in tandem with Facebook and Twitter who will do the same thing, basically delete hundreds of thousands of groups maybe, where people are talking about vaccine safety. Now, you can take this with a pinch of salt if you like, because while I know the guy definitely works for Google, verification of this information is basically impossible. But I believe him. Now, he's not working at management level, so he's not, you know, sitting in on management meetings and listening to this stuff. And I did ask him that. How do you know? And he said, well, this sort of stuff trickles down, Richie. He said, they've made the decision. And what you're seeing in the newspapers and listening to on talk radio about how dangerous anti-vaxxers are and how much of a threat they represent to everybody's safety, this is all a build-up to this culling of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of YouTube channels and accounts. It's happening, Richie. He also said that the claims that much of the 5G information, which they call misinformation, much of the vaccine information, which they call misinformation, the claims that we hear or that we read about in our newspapers, the claims that Russia is behind this stuff is obviously nonsense. It's obviously nonsense that Russia is behind it. But basically, this is all part of them legislating for mass censorship, getting the public to accept that there is a big threat you know, that your health and safety is at risk because a foreign agent is spreading this false information online, even though the vast majority of groups on Facebook, at least as, as far as I've seen, and I'm not on Facebook very often, but I do ask Raj, and Raj tells me he's in, he's in several of these groups. The vast majority of these groups are, are what you would call grassroots groups set up by ordinary people who are concerned. They're not Russia. But it's those groups they want to get rid of on the pretext that it's Russia spreading the misinformation. So if you've got, you know, your own YouTube channel and you've put information on there, you really need to back it up. Anything that you've uploaded, videos that you might want to keep because you might have had an interview with somebody, you might have had a video with some interesting information, you've got to put these things somewhere safe, you've got to download them and put them, make hard copies of them because this is coming down according to my mate. And that's all I can say about that. Okay? I asked him about, you know, what, 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 what does his mates, what do his mates think about it? And he said, there hasn't been much talk about it, maybe because people are very, very nervous working in tech that if you were to be dismissed from a company labelled as a troublemaker, you might find it difficult then in the future to get a job in the industry with another company. So that's what he's saying to me. He says that he's hearing that the decision has been made in order to try and kind of see off 
opposition or resistance to a COVID vaccine. They've already decided in the weeks leading up to the vaccine becoming available, there's going to be a mass deletion of channels. People will be difficult to find using the Google search engine. And he reckons discussions have already taken place with Twitter and Facebook to work in tandem doing that. That's what he says and that's what he said to me. You can take that with a pinch of salt or you can take it to heart. It's entirely up to you. This is Wednesday's Richie Allen Radio Show live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Hi, I'm Richie Allen. All right, everybody. Sammy Davis Jr., Candyman on the Richie Allen Radio Show. 26 minutes past the hour. Wednesday's programme, July 22nd. No sign of summer. No sign of summer at all. My guest this hour is no stranger to you. He needs very little introduction. Uh, A very popular and successful businessman. These days I see him as a human rights activist and advocate. Sadly, uh, despite a terrific effort, I think, he was unsuccessful in his challenge, uh, his high court challenge against the government's introduction of the lockdown measures. But I don't believe that story is over. To tell us more about that and to talk generally about what's been going on uh, of late, let's welcome back to the programme, Simon Dolan. Simon, welcome back. How are you? Now, I'm good, Richie. How are you, mate? I'm very good, mate. I was disappointed, of course, with um, the result. Not surprised, but disappointed. I think you gave it a, a great crack. Y- you did mention looking at the possibility of an appeal. Is that a reality? Will it happen, do you think? Yeah, the, appeal's got, the appeal paperwork has gone in, so we're Lovely. just waiting to hear back from the court now as to whether we're actually allowed to appeal. Uh, it, it'll be remarkable if we're not allowed, but, you know, it was... <laughs> It's quite remarkable what the judge did in, in, in the case that we had in so much as he just brushed aside all the evidence um, yeah, the and evidence. just said, well, you know, it was down to the government to decide and they did it and it's fine, which is bizarre. So. And you made a very good point in the wake of that, which I, I hope people picked up on. The government, well, the judiciary has handed the government the licence in the future. At any time it feels like to say, everybody get indoors, lock your windows and, you know, sacrifice your your living. Uh, You picked up on that. That's basically what happened. It's exactly what happened. And that's why the appeal is so important, because, you know, if we're not allowed to appeal this, then we don't have a democracy anymore. You know, we're, we're living in a dictatorship and it's one run by seemingly Matt Hancock and possibly Dominic Cummings. It's certainly not run by um, by uh, Boris Johnson. So um, it, it, it's it, it's actually scary times. It's maybe a bit too uh, a bit too harsh, but it's uh, it's unusual times. That's for sure. And, and it's not the Britain, I don't think, that everybody thought they lived in. Yeah, I was going to ask you. My first question was going to be a bit cheeky and a bit sensationalist. I was going to ask you, you mentioned there about democracy. Do you... Is, has your worldview changed? If you go back to January, are you a totally different man with a different mindset now to the one that existed in January of this year? Hmm, what a great question. I, in some ways, I think, um, if you know, in, posi- in positive ways in a lot of it, because in, in some respects with this, um, with this whole process, I've, I've found myself being involved in something bigger than me and and that's always a good thing I think you know I feel as though I'm I'm doing some good in the world as opposed to just making money nothing wrong with making money but you know it's a different experience for me um and and I feel as though you know there's an awful lot of people that we've you know given hope to and 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 helped and it's also nice you know when you wake up one morning and, and you realize that you're not the only sane person in the room you know there's plenty of us around but we just seem to be drowned out by the uh, by the idiots uh, for whatever reason. And I think, you know, I, I think it's a silent majority. I really do. But people are just a lot of people are just a bit scared to stand out and be a bit different or go against the government, uh, you know, dictate. Um, but the more people that do it, the more people will do it. And, yeah. and that's what keeps me going, actually. It's hard to talk to people these days without one side or the other resulting to ad hominem attacks and that's the sad thing that's that i've noticed in recent years discourse has basically been destroyed like the government admitted during the week that conservatively no pun intended there might be two hundred thousand deaths attributable to the lockdown not to the virus now i've said to one or two people put your weapons down drop your guard and stop telling me that i don't care about old people and I'll stop calling you an idiot. Let's just be human beings for a minute. 200,000 
versus 45,000. And we know the 45,000 is dodgy anyway. We know mm. that the figure of 45,000 is, 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 is very suspect. And I still can't get through to him, Simon. It's astonishing. I say if we leave our political persuasions to one side, if we take the chips off of our shoulders and we look at that data, let's pretend 45,000 deaths is true. You're talking five times more deaths because of the lockdown. And you still think it's a good idea. And they look at you with glassy eyes and call you a gammon. That's where we yeah. are. <laughs> I, I don't actually know what gammon means. It's me. I'll, I'll, I'm the gammon. It, 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 you know, it's a middle-aged white guy, balding, who's got a permanent red neck because he's always angry. But I'm not always angry. It's supposed to be a right-wing guy. You know, I'm not right-wing either. But anyway, how do you get through to people? I mean, you're a guy who's, you've been in boardrooms, you've, you, you've had meetings, hostile sometimes, I, I presume. You've had to learn to be diplomatic as a successful businessman. Otherwise, you wouldn't be uh, successful. How do you get through to people that this is madness? Uh, it's sometimes difficult. Um, I mean, you know, just going back slightly, that report that the government you, you just quoted there, the 200,000 deaths, what a lot of people don't know is, is that report was actually produced in April. They knew that was their prediction of how many people would die under lockdown. And that was only a short lockdown. They didn't know that it was going to be going on for three months. So uh, they were perfectly well aware of what it was going to do. And yet they continued on with it. And that, for me, is absolutely unforgivable. Like, I, I think there's an enormous story that's coming out, um, certainly over the care homes, but just about how um, incompetent the government have actually been over this. Um, so it'll come out and in, in time, you know, we'll be proved right. And then everybody else will think that they thought the same as we did and, and life will go on in whatever fashion it goes on. But I've always, you know, for me, I understand numbers. That's that's what I'm good at. And, and that was where it all kicked off. You know, the numbers of deaths and everything just never made any sense to me um and if people understand numbers you can usually get through to them if they can't understand numbers and it's just all about emotions then you're screwed because they'll always remember the um you know forty five thousand dead and it was covid and it's this silent killer and all the other lines that they've been fed um to scare them yeah the government has done a really really good campaign a really good marketing campaign for scaring the life out of people um, and these people are not stupid. You know, the people that you're arguing with, they're not stupid. They're just scared nine times out of 10. So uh, I, try, I tend, you know, you have a little bit of sympathy with them. Uh, sometimes you feel as though you're banging your head against a brick wall. But hey, we've got to keep trying. Huh? Yeah, you can't be hostile. On on the, the lack of any challenge to it, isn't it really depressing that rather than go after the nonsense of the science, the Labour Party decided its primary plan of attack or, or line of attack would be to criticise the government for not doing enough and criticise them for the numbers. I mean, that's incredibly depressing. If that doesn't demonstrate that the parties in this two-party political system, it is, forget the Lib Dems and the Greens, if they're basically, they're the same. Centre-left, centre-right, they're the same. It was an open goal for the Labour Party, a so-called party of the working class and of working men and women, to go after the government and say from the get-go, listen, these numbers don't add up. Locking the country down is not the right way to go, but they didn't. I mean, if you reflected on that, the Labour Party, we talk about the government all the time, but we need to have a look at what the Labour Party has done. I think the only thing more disappointing than the Conservatives in all this have been the Labour Party. Uh, you know, because you're quite right. You know, they they were the, the, the ones out there that should have been saying and questioning the government. But do do you actually remember them ever questioning the government on anything during lockdown? No, I don't think there was ever one, was there? There was no criticisms, no nothing. What they're doing now is to jump on it and say, oh, well, you should have done it for longer or you should have done it sooner or you should have done this or you should have done that. Well, you're, you know, you're three or four months too late, mate. You really should have been talking about this at the time when you could have done something about it. You know, how about voting against the coronavirus bill that locked us all up? Uh, you know, but no, you didn't do that. Literally nothing. Literally no, uh, you know, no comeback, no questions whatsoever. And, uh, you know, genuinely, I think the Labour Party ceased to be a party of working people probably, what, 30 years ago, maybe? Long maybe time long. ago. Well, that's a sad reality. As, as, as somebody who, you know, is a, a, a devoted trade union, we wouldn't get on, Simon, me and you in, in real life. We, we no, get on on the radio. Funny, though, that we, we, and this is what I've found a lot. This isn't this whole lockdown, not lockdown, masks, no masks. This isn't actually divided along traditional no. party political lines, is it? 
you know, so we, we're completely different. I'm, you know, conservative with a small C and you're a trade union guy, all the rest of it. Yeah. And yet we get on and we can talk about it. And we actually agree on this, yeah. uh, which is quite really quite unusual. And I found that an awful lot. You know, people that I wouldn't agree on anything else with, we agree on this. And that brings me on to, you know, whether there is actually a massive void now in UK politics. There's so many disenfranchised people on both sides that I think actually probably all want the same thing. You know, even though we were traditionally very divided, but, you know, by bit economic policy or whatever it might be. Um, so that, that for me is an interesting thought. You know, maybe it has actually shook up politics. Um, who fills the void, of course, is, is, a, is a completely different question. But I know, um, can, can I just jump in? I know that you, that's something that's been, you've got a very big Twitter following. And when, when you tweet it, it, it usually starts a broad conversation and a lot of people have been encouraging you and others and am I right in saying not that I'm voyeuristically trolling uh, I should say trolling your 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 tweets but you've um you've gone as far as to say that you might financially support anybody who stands in future elections on anti-lockdown platforms am I right in saying that yeah, I think it's gone beyond lockdown now because, you know, on the, on the whole, we're not locked down anymore. Uh, for me, this now comes down to a, a freedom thing. You know, it's freedom of speech. It's it's liberty, um, freedom to your own life, you know, self-responsibility and all those good things. Um, and that that would be the platform on which I would support a party. You know, so if, if the Conservatives or Labour said, you know, we recognise life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we're willing to um, mandate it in a English constitution or in some enshrined law that meant they couldn't do this again and they couldn't block free speech and all the rest of those things. I'd be happy to get behind anybody who said that. You know, the rest of it, economically or whatever, I don't think matters too much. I think it's this just those principles. Um, so, yeah, anybody who was going to run on on uh, on those, I would be happy to back. Very interesting. Simon Dolan is our guest. Simon is still embroiled in a legal battle with the UK government over the legality of the lockdown. And uh, I'm glad he is. I really am. For the rest of us, it's not easy. Simon has done well in business and he's a self-made man. And I admire that. It's easy to do nothing, but he's uh, put his own money behind this and he has crowdfunded as well. Uh, and I really appreciate it. I find that most people don't understand and we come back to the media again they don't even understand what has been happening like the amendment to the coronavirus bill that allows public health officers to order a constable to take somebody to be tested for coronavirus i mean that's north korea simon i'm not looking for sensationalist jingoistic um lines one-liners here to throw out but i mean we're living in the uk here uh, to be told by a constable that listen you you, you have to report to a center on monday at, at half nine if you don't we'll come and get you mm. give me a break Right. But these things just get rolled out again. There was no debate in no. Parliament. There was no nothing. It's just rolled out. And the, I don't I don't think that anybody that they've actually taken anybody away. I, I don't think that they've ever used that law. No, but they've given themselves but, the bloody power to do it. Exactly that. That is not what matters. So now, you know, the, actually what what in what introduced the lockdown wasn't the coronavirus bill. It was the 1984 Public Health Act. That's right. You know, and that's 40, you know, knocking on 40 years old. So it may well be that this new thing, this new regulation that they've come up with where they can just come and forcibly take you away if they suspect you of having coronavirus. I mean, how ludicrous that sounds. But that may not be used for 20 years and it may be used for a different disease that we don't know about at the moment or whatever other nefarious purpose, purpose that they might have. Problem with laws is, is, is they get on the statute book, they never come off. Yeah. Isn't it funny, Kevin Myers whom we, on the programme, we have a lot of time for a very, very, very well-known and very respected Irish writer who came to grief uh, three years ago for writing something that somebody didn't like, um, even though he was supported by the vast majority of uh, Irish Jews and um, well-known Jews even in the UK. He made a funny joke about Jews not being stupid, ironically, and he lost his job um, writing for, for Irish broadsheet newspapers. But he said the same thing. He said, "Give these powers, they're easily taken away. They don't come back. And, and then he said something. It was funny. I see a lot of people like Kevin Myers, a lot of establishment people. I don't want to call you establishment, Simon, because I don't know you well enough. But people who have, you know, worked worked and, 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 and done well for themselves, used their brains and made their way up and made a good life for themselves. Society people, we could say. I see more and more of them utterly bewildered. 
And Kevin said to me the other day, it's dawning on him now, on this programme, he said, these people, they're not like us, Richie. These politicians. You know, who wants to have power over people in that way? You know, we're not like that. We don't see life like that, telling people what to do and imposing things on people. But they seem to get some sort of a kick out of it, these people, don't they? Many of yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably less charitable. I think the only reason the vast majority of them become pol- politicians is because they can't get a job doing anything else. They're, they're utterly unemployable in the private sector, that's for sure. Um, and who actually wants to go and become a politician? You know, you, you the, the what you have to do in order to go and even, you know, get a seat or whatever, and then... Uh, the stuff that you have to do when you're in parliament and how little power you actually have and, 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 you know, you, you've got pretty incompetent people there. And I don't want to name any names. I'm sure some of them are well-meaning, um, but the well-meaning ones I would imagine sit on the back benches because they're never going to go up the ranks because they don't do what you need to do. And we all know that stab everybody in the back and this and that and the other. So yeah, you do end up getting some awful people in positions of power. And of course, yes, they love it. They don't do it for the money. You know, there's not much money in politics. Um, but they certainly do do it for the power. And what better way to have power over people than to scare the life out of them, yeah. take their job away, and then give them benefits. Yeah. You say there's not much money in politics, but, you know, to the ordinary bloke, I mean, the last job I was offered back in 2014, I was offered £50,000 a year to present a breakfast show on a well-known radio station in the UK. And uh, David, I God blast him. Um, and, and my missus and everybody else said don't take it <laughs> do your own thing at least you'll be able to say what you want and of course they're right but I mean they earn minimum of it's 90 odd thousand pounds and that's before they get payments and you know various committees I hear what you're saying it's not bad for sitting on your backside and don't even get me started on the House of Lords and the 300 pounds a day for snoring and farting your way through the afternoon Simon I don't think they're as bad off as maybe you're, you're, you're kind of letting on no, no, I guess that, that that's a fair comment. That's a fair comment. Um, yeah. Hey, listen, I think to, they're, they're, it's a, certainly the most money they would ever earn doing anything. Put it Well, uh, 100% right. Simon Dolan is our guest. Now, this Friday, they're urging people to wear masks in shops. They're saying it's mandatory. It is interesting. Sems Valley Police, some police forces further south have said they won't police it. They don't have the manpower. And even when Cressida Dick was on the Nick Ferrari programme on LBC earlier today, she was very vague about what the police would and wouldn't do and was almost saying, you know, don't call us unless you're rolling around on the floor fighting people who won't wear a mask. It doesn't sound like the police, that their heart is in enforcing this thing on Friday. I know you've a lot to say on this, Simon. What about Friday and, and these masks? Well, I mean, there's the principle behind it, isn't there, first of all, but then the ridiculous situation where you've got several supermarkets that have come on and said, well, you know, the customers have to wear masks, but we're not enforcing it. And you're not allowed to ask them if they're not, you know, why they're not wearing a mask. Um, So Sainsbury's, Tesco's, I think they were they were pretty good. Um, And then you've got just to shame them, you've got Morrison saying you have to produce a medical certificate. Um, So, we're we're, you know, we're hoping to uh, shame them so that they won't do that. So on the one side, you've got the people whose shops they are saying, well, we're not enforcing it. And then on the other side, you've got the police coming out and saying, well, we're not enforcing it. We haven't got time. It's ridiculous. So they've introduced or they're introducing a law which in and of itself is ridiculous, but which no one wants to enforce. Uh, How stupid does a government look? Um, That's ridiculous. Can you can you just repeat that about the the supermarkets? You mentioned Tesco. You mentioned you might have mentioned Asda. Have they said that they're not going to enforce it? And you said that maybe the the other one, um, the the, the more posh one. Morrison said that they'll ask people for medical certificates. Yeah, Morrison's has said this. This is stuff that I've actually seen, and it, it's usually internal memos from yeah. uh, that people have sent me. So Morrison's have said that they have to wear them, and they need to see a medical certificate if they've got an exemption. Uh, Tesco's have said we're not enforcing it. Sainsbury's have said we're not enforcing it. Um, well Asda said they are enforcing it. Um, who else do I know about? Lidl, Aldi's, they're both not inf- not enforcing it, as far as I'm aware. Um, they're the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. But you'll soon find out when you go to your supermarket. And what, what I would urge people to do is if they're going into their supermarket and they've got a an exemption, uh, and an exemption can just simply be that you don't want to wear it. You know, you suffer stress if you wear one. So it's quite easy. Yeah. Um, if they then say to you, well, you're not allowed to come in or whatever, please do take a video get it on video and then send it in either to you or I on Twitter because our barrister has said there is a prima facie case for the supermarkets 
discriminating against disabled people if they do exactly that. And then we'll take a test case and then we'll just see. That'd be brilliant, that. I'm... Um... <laughs> I'm very healthy, I'm fit, but I do have asthma and I do sometimes need the inhaler. And funnily enough, I did drop a, a message to my GP on Thursday or Friday last week, Simon, and I said, look, what's the story? And the GP said, well, you don't have to wear one if, if you don't want to, and you shouldn't, and uh, maybe have your inhaler to hand. And I'm not a hard man by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm a proud Irishman. I'm not going to stand in front of a security guard and fumble around in my pocket for an inhaler. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to justify myself to anybody. So if Tesco's are saying they won't enforce it, they're local to me, as are ASDA. I can't get over Morrison's talking about medical certificates. We should bankrupt Morrison's. That's outrageous, that. I say to my yeah, I tried, listeners... I tried today. That got quite a bit of traction on there, actually. Everybody just saying, well, I'm not shopping at Morrison's. You know, and it's fine because... If you know, I'm a, a great believer in freedom and all that rest of it. And if a shop says we, you know, we don't want you coming in our shop if you're not wearing a mask or you're not wearing a pink t-shirt or whatever, well, that's fine. You know, that's that's within their remit, as is within your rights to simply not shop there and go and shop somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we'd we'll all go to Tesco's or you know whoever welcomes us. That's what I say. You know, if, if you've got a shop that actually wants to serve you and welcomes you as a customer and values you, then go there. If you've got a shop that treats you like some leper, then don't go there. And pretty soon, you know, the harsh realities of commercial life will take over. I, I say to my listeners, I've never given my li listeners any advice in years and years of doing this program. I've never told them what to do because it's not my right to do that. But here's my advice. If you go to Morrison's and Simon is right, and Simon has seen the memo and they ask you for a certificate, never go back there again. Punish them. How dare any business that you're going to go and spend your hard-earned cash, 50 quid, 60 quid, 70 quid, whatever it is, how dare they try and make your life a misery while you're in there? They should be bending over backwards in this climate to get your uh, feet in the door. Simon, you're a successful businessman. Um, I mean, I doubt, it must be complete anathema to you, this notion of making life difficult for people to do business. Christ almighty, these are mad times, eh? Mad times. Well, no politician has ever run a business. No. So... You know, they come up with all these rules and regulations, which, let's face it, are not written by the politicians. They're written by the advisors who've never had any other jobs um, and scientists and behavioral this and behavioral that. And, and they're not thinking about it from how to run a business. They're thinking about it. Well, how can we follow these guidelines? And of course, what they do is they give the guidelines just to protect people, just to make sure. And if the business can't deal with it, well, then that's down to them. They're just poor business people. You know, <laughs> that's that, yeah. that will be their attitude. But of course, if you've got a restaurant, restaurants basically break even at about 60 or 70 percent occupancy. Well, they can only run at 60 percent occupancy if all the tables are spread apart. So what's the incentive to open? They just simply won't. You know, they'll disappear. And then that's a, another little piece of the high street gone and, and on and on and on it goes. It's funny you say that Tom Kerridge obviously has come out very strongly in the last week saying that no shows are killing the business. And ironically, not ironically, but a lot of people who know Tom as being successful from television, they piled in on him and said that he was a greedy bastard. But they didn't know what you know, which, which is that they only break even at 60% occupancy. And now, because of social distancing measures, he's got less covers. So if people don't turn up, he's screwed. And so is every other restaurant in the country. Nobody has any idea what the financial implications are going to be if millions of people are out of work. Where's that money going to come from to give these people benefits? This is the thing that kills me. This is why Labour, Starmer, uh, Lisa and Andy, they should be screaming from the rooftops, open the country up, ditch the masks. This is crazy. But they're not. They're going along with this narrative that we've got to keep things like this until we get the vaccine. Now, I know you've got opinions on that as well. I know you're not anti-vaccine. I know that you're not anti-science. You're not anti-medicine. But this is spooky, Simon, isn't it? To be telling people, listen, uh, you, you know, we see these articles recently where we've got academics saying that things will not go back to normal unless at least 65 or 70 percent of everybody takes this uh, bloody vaccine. This is not free. This is not a free country when you're being told you must take a vaccine. Otherwise, maybe you don't get to go and watch Simon Dolan uh, race his car or you don't get to go to Old Trafford uh, to watch the football. Shocking stuff, this, right? Uh, it's horrendous. I mean, I, like you say, I've got nothing particularly against vaccines. I, I've spoken to people who have been damaged by them. And then but, you know, the vast majority of people are just kind of fine, you know, and maybe they do some good. I think that's been pretty proven why it eradicated certain diseases. But you, you're allowed to be against individual vaccines. You know, it, there's lots of different vaccines for lots of different things. Some of them tried and tested. 
which I would be fine with taking, and other ones that have been rushed out by, um, you know, on, on the basis of politics, you know, how can we get it out as quickly as we possibly can, by enormous drug companies that have been indemnified by the government, so that if anything goes wrong, it means the drug company can't be held liable. Um, in in a in a in a um, environment where people are panicking and there's fear being stoked, and you know, you're I don't think they're mandating it, but they're certainly saying, look, they're certainly trying to pile on the social pressure um, for having a, for having a vaccine. This can only go wrong. You know, no vaccine has ever been made this quickly, and they're actually boasting about it. Yeah. You know, look how quick we've got this vaccine out. We've tested it on 1,200 people, all of whom were healthy and relatively young and fit. And the only side effects that half of them had were headaches and a temperature, which you can just take a, a paracetamol for. These are side effects after the first week. You know, some side effects might take years to come out, two or three years to come out. They certainly not tested them on ill people and they've not tested them on elderly people and all the other things that they're supposed to do. But no worries. We need to get this out in a hurry. And we've ordered 90 million of them. And roll up, roll up, have Uncle Matt's lovely pile of whatever it is shoved yeah. in your arm. Uh, if you want to do it, knock yourself out. Happy, happy for you. But I don't want to do it, and uh, lots of people don't. So that's why it shouldn't be mandated. You know, you take away that choice, and that's uh, that's horrendous. Yeah, it's really horrendous. And it, it's worth that they would be so underhand about it in terms of well, we wouldn't demand that you get it, or you know, we'll put you in prison. They're not that stupid. It's a case of I mean, I heard Jeremy Vine the other day interviewing, you know virologists and experts in, well, so-called experts in vaccine man manufacturing. And they were all agreeing that it's time to mandate it. And the way to do that was coercion. So mum loses child support payments or a disability allowance or whatever, or the kids are banned from going to the school or the local park. And of course, that makes it so difficult because I have been, like yourself, you know, you know, I, I value my own personal independent freedom and I won't allow anybody tell me that I must have this. Um, and, and I will stick by that regardless of the social consequences. But for very many people, they'll find themselves in a position, Simon, where they will have no choice whatsoever. And that's what sickens me about it. There will be people who will, com will morally object to it and will have objections on the grounds that you just outlined that maybe this was rushed, maybe this is a bit dangerous, but they'll find themselves in a position where they'll have no choice, won't they? Well, I think so. And, and what's really scary about that is, is the only ones actually that the government can really compel to have this thing will be people who rely on the government for state benefits, maybe furlough payments, you know, maybe whatever other benefits that they get from the government, i.e. all the people who are reliant on the state. And that's a lot of people because lots of people are relying on the state now because they did lockdown and loads of people are out of work. So, you know, if you've got seven or eight or nine million, that's probably seven million people unemployed by Christmas in the UK, which is looking likely, um, then all of those people rely on benefits. Well, queue up and have your vaccine. But unfortunately, if you haven't got your vaccine certificate, we won't be able to send you benefit payment this week. Wow. So if it's a choice out of eating or having a vaccine that's not been tested, what do you do? Like yeah. you say, a lot of people and that, you know, and that doesn't even bring into the social pressures. You know, how many people clapped on a Thursday for the NHS? Not because they appreciated the NHS, because they didn't want their neighbours looking at them and saying you didn't go out and clap. You know, it's peer pressure. It's uh, it's, it's kind of schoolboy tactics, really, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, people do feel this. The societal pressures are absolutely huge. So you've got kind of a double pincer there, haven't you? You know, you've got the compulsion on one side because otherwise you won't get your benefits. And then you've got everybody else telling you that, you know, it's not for you. It's to save a life, which is what they're doing with the whole masks thing. You know, masks don't protect you. They protect the other person. How evil of you not to protect other people. You, you fiend. Selfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this creates this enormous division in, in, uh, in society, you know, as if we needed any more division. Christ, we've got, you know, black and whites that are now being divided because of media. You know, I, I don't actually know anybody who's particularly racist. I think people, we now tend to get on really quite well together. And of course, they're outliers. But, you know, you'd think that we lived in an apartheid society the way that the media has portrayed it. So you've got the divisions there. And now you've got the divisions by people who are pro-lockdown and, uh, and anti-lockdown. And now you've got divisions between people who wear masks and don't wear a mask. And on and on and on it goes. And, you know, divide and conquer is the old phrase, isn't it? And it's funny, you know. you mentioned, it's funny you mentioned the peer pressure. There is a, a well-known app called Nextdoor. And it's particularly useful when, when you live in uh, a community like the one I live in, which is um, a proud working class area. 
And it's handy because um, neighbours get on it. It's uh, run by a successful, uh, I, I think it was, a, it was invented by a successful techie guy. Uh, next door, you recommend somebody to be on it and you're on it and you kind of keep in touch with your neighbours. There might be somebody hanging around. You know the usual, Simon, the usual thing, neighbourhood watching that. And also, hmm. you know, I need a plumber. Does anybody know one? And within minutes, you got a plumber. Very good. But I did notice during the whole clap thing. Honestly, I noticed people going on there going, disappointed with my street this week. Disappointed with my street this week. And I saw somebody else actually publishing numbers. Yeah, nobody standing out from number 26 and number 28. I mean, that's just insane stuff. You know, obviously, we, we never went outside. And but not going outside. I found myself one Thursday, one Thursday not going outside. I found myself wondering, just very briefly, you know, were there people pointing and saying stuff? And I just put it out of my head straight away. How conformist are we? I, 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 I used to think that we were a bit more rebellious, a bit more anti-authority, a bit more, you know, a bit able to stand up for ourselves. But sometimes it just doesn't seem like it. And it's going to be put to the test now this coming week and with the vaccine. Simon Dolan is our guest. Uh, last couple of minutes. Uh, do support Simon. Follow him on Twitter. There's only one Simon Dolan on Twitter. Um, successful businessman, very popular, taking the government to court over the legality of the lockdown. Uh, he's a human rights advocate now these days, whether he likes it or not. And uh, we're glad that people with his profile are out there. And, and uh, you know, long may he continue. Final word to you, Simon. I know I ask you this every time you come on, but what would you like people to do? What would you like us and, and my audience to do listening to you tonight if they could take one thing away and do something positive? What would it be? I think initially, just because it's coming up this Friday, we fight back on the mask thing. Just don't be brought into this. You have to wear a mask. You have to wear a mask to save another life and all this stuff Um, because you don't. And it doesn't save anybody's life. And it's just literally a a control thing. There isn't anything else to it. So I think, you know, if I would urge civil disobedience, I think that would be a really good and fairly passive way to um, to start. And just fight back on this stuff because they've gone. This, this for me was a straw that broke the camels. There would be many, but this one really was like no. And uh, so yeah, fight back against that. Don't wear them. Just simply don't wear them. And if anybody if anybody comes up and says you have to wear one, you say no. Actually, I'm uh, I'm disabled. I su- suffer severe anxiety if I have to wear one. I'm actually going to say if anybody challenges me with it, I'm actually going to say that I was in the forces and I was waterboarded. Get in there. I- Get in there. I love it. I love. It. You've <laughs> set something off in me now and our listeners. We need to. Speak been the wildest fiction at the front doors of these supermarkets fantastic i love it yeah me and me and sylvester stallone and uh, and johnny depp yeah we were in we were in laos in 68 absolutely right yeah too right i've got a disability i don't have to wear it so let me in please and walk past them and see what happens yeah i'm proud of today brilliant Simon, thanks for giving us your time, mate. I really appreciate it. I, I said this before and I'll say it again. I wish you were speaking for five or six minutes on uh, the BBC News at six or at nine o'clock or ten o'clock, whatever it is. But sadly, that's the state of the media today. Um, don't depress yourselves by looking at an, at, a, at, an, at an editorial in today's Times advocating taking the vaccine. Don't do it to yourself. <laughs> do do have a look at dreadful uh, uh, pro vaccine propaganda. But anyway, mate, look, we'll talk again, obviously, in the very near future, and we hope, uh, fingers crossed and toes crossed, that your appeal against the High Court decision will be successful. Godspeed to you, Simon, mate. Thanks for coming on as usual. Thank you, buddy. Always fun. I'll speak to you soon. Look forward to it. Thanks, Simon Dolan. What a top bloke he is. And thank uh, God there are guys out there like him taking them on. I really appreciate that. It is uh, 90 seconds or, or, or 60 seconds to uh, the top of the hour. In hour two, I'll be joined by Fiona Marie Flanagan. I had a lovely chat with Fiona off air today. I've been looking at Fiona's tweets for a long time and meaning to invite her on. Uh, I never did, uh, but I did uh, this morning and uh, thankfully she's available. Fascinating lady, academic, uh, citizen journalist, you could say, a uh, social commentator. We're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about the changing face of Ireland. We're going to talk about climate change. We're going to talk a little bit about 5G and, say it for me, and the virus itself and whether people with the virus or with respiratory viruses might be adversely affected by 5G. There are papers emerging, genuine papers, from peer-reviewed people, or I should say papers that have been peer-reviewed by academics, that are suggesting that it's not a good thing, uh, 5G and the non-ionising radiation, millimetre wave and all of that. Not good for people who've got respiratory problems, so I'm looking forward to getting getting into that uh, with Fiona Marie Flanagan. It is six o'clock. 
This is uh, Richie Allen, the BBG, not the BBC, live from Stalford in Greater Manchester at 6 o'clock, summertime, British summertime. It's over to FSN for the headlines. Back with plenty more after these. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Rebecca Foster. The United States has ordered the closure of the Chinese consulate in Texas and the latest escalation of tensions between the two countries. The daily death toll from COVID in the U.S. has passed 1,000 for the first time in two months. And the U.K. government is looking at offering the security services greater powers to stop foreign interference. Thank you, Rebecca Foster. Fiona Marie Flanagan in a few minutes' time. Uh, we'll have a tune before that as well. Uh, keep chatting amongst yourselves on Twitter. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Europe's most listened to independent radio show. Nothing like it. The Richie Allen Radio Show. Live on RichieAllen.co.uk. Fab Radio in Manchester. TriggerWarning.tv and multiple other platforms as well. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbayerski.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. This is The Richie Allen Show, the most listened to independent news radio show in Europe. Welcome back. One or two people tweeting me suggesting that I was exaggerating about my conversation with a Google employee. Let me tell you this. Anybody who says that they have never told a lie in their lives would be lying. We have all lied in our lives one way or another, every one of us. What I have never done in my career as a journalist is I have never opened a microphone and lied to my listeners. Never. Because it's all you have as a broadcaster, as a journalist. All you have is your word and your integrity. And when you are found to be telling lies, it's over. And it's over forever. A journalist or a broadcaster can never recover, ever, when it has been proven that they have told a lie to their listeners. And I understand um, people being sceptical and suspicious about things, um, and I have no problem with that. But knowingly going on air and saying something which is untrue, it'll never happen. It has never happened in my 20-plus year uh, career as a producer and broadcaster, and it will never happen in the future. What, the, uh, uh, what my contact at Google told me wasn't exactly groundbreaking, was it, really? This is the plan. The plan is in the run-up to the release of the COVID vaccine, I was told, and I did tell you you can take it with a pinch of salt, you don't have to believe it, I can't verify it, but the plan is for a mass culling of channels on YouTube and groups on Facebook of people who discuss vaccine safety and who might be sceptical about vaccines. It's not that hard to believe, really. I think if I ever do come on air and and uh, exaggerate or, or lie to my listeners, I think I'll make up um, an absolute massive whopper. It'll be a lot more exciting than that. Anyhow, four minutes past the hour, this is Pussycat on The Richie Allen Show. Fiona Marie Flanagan will be live from Dublin in about three minutes' time, and I'm looking forward to you meeting her uh, for the first time on this programme. All righty. Right, that is um, music from Pussycat. The song is called Mississippi on the Richie Allen Radio Show. Six and a half minutes past the hour. It's been a lovely afternoon in Salford. Bit muggy, a bit overcast. I'm really excited about welcoming my next guest to the programme because we've been connected on social media for some time and she's always posting interesting things, interesting articles and also links to interesting information about a wide variety of subjects. 
uh, let's call her a journalist. She's a citizen journalist, um, formerly an academic, a social commentator, I would say. And she's also very good. I've, I've watched her on YouTube being interviewed by various people on very interesting subjects. So I'm thrilled to welcome from uh, Bolio Clear from Dublin, uh, our friend Fiona Marie Flanagan. Fiona, dear Gwit, welcome to the programme. How are you? Dear Smirwit, Richie, I'm very well, thank you. And um, thank you so much for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's overdue, really. I mean, it is. I've been meaning to do it for a long, long time, but uh, but here you are. And, and uh, we're going to get through lots and lots between now and about five to uh, the top of the hour. A lot of our listeners are connected to Fiona on uh, Twitter as well. If there's anything you'd like to mention, do just uh, drop me a tweet or drop a, a tweet to Fiona and I'll uh, mention it as we go along. Uh, I, I'm going to very briefly read a column from The Times. That's uh, The Times of uh, England, amazingly. Uh, Roderick O'Gorman has accepted an apology from the actor John Connors after he took part in a social media campaign linking the children's minister to views allegedly condoning pedophilia. O'Gorman was subjected to online abuse stoked by uh, far-right Twitter accounts which reposted a photo of him with the British human rights and LGBT activist Peter Tatchell at Dublin Pride in 2018. So John Connors has apologised. Fiona, this is very interesting. I've been following this and you've been following this as well. Me, because I've interviewed Tatchell uh, a number of times over the years. But a lot of people... Um, and a lot of people from across the political spectrum, right people on the right, people on the left, very concerned about this guy, Roderick O'Gorman, and his relationship with Peter Tatchell. I know you've been following it. Uh, do you want to bring our listeners up to speed on what actually went went down, what was going on with O'Gorman, Tatchell, and why people were so worried about it? Yes, I mean, it, it was very concerning, and I guess it raised a lot of issues and brought them to the fore in, in people's minds and parents especially. So I'm actually, you know, perversely very glad it happened. Um, regards O'Gorman, obviously he's a, a highly educated new minister for children um, who happens to be gay, just the same as our previous minister for children was. That's never an issue, you know, and in Ireland at this stage, we've gone so far beyond, you know, the gay rights. I mean, it's it's assumed this is not a homophobic country on either side of the political divide, if you want to even call it left and right. So when O'Gorman um, was appointed, that was fine. But very, very soon, um, we started to see on the Twitter feeds this association with Peter Tatchell. And this pricked up a lot of people's ears and a lot of people got concerned and they started doing some digging into the background of Tatchell. And by association, people started to feel really worried that Tatchell's views on paedophilia might be reflected through O'Gorman. Like there was no major accusation made at Roderick at this point. It was it was more guilty by association. But at the same time, it did bring to the forefront the new relationship and sex education program that is being pushed out by our government in any event. So, you know, people, this, this is one issue that people, that really, you know, galvanizes people, as I say, left and right, this anti pedophilia. And so what happened was Herman Kelly from the Irish Freedom Party, we had Renewa, which is another sort of conservative type party, you know, took the reins and got a, a organized a protest. And John Connors gave a rousing speech at this. He said, you know, this was a hill he wanted to stand on. He motivated and he encouraged so many people with his speech. It is not homophobic. And there was a lovely gay guy, Paddy Manning, spoke out as well. He happens to be a gay conservative. He doesn't agree with this, you know, any paedophilia agenda. And the reason I say agenda is because in the relationships and sex education, there is a push to, in my view, sexualize young children, to introduce them to concepts which are way, you know, beyond what I think a young child will be capable of absorbing. Um, and we're talking about World Health Organization directives, such as, and, and I hate to even say this, Richie, but I'm going to have to, you know, give you the word for it teaching them about masturbation yeah. um, when they're very young, teaching them porn literacy, um, teaching them about reproductive rights, including abortion. But the point is to actually completely remove any value system from that. So they want to push 
any form of religion out of this education and just teach them this sort of evidence-based factual um, RSE. And, you know, I happen to be pro-life. I'm proud of it. I'll, I, you know, I'll debate anyone on it. And my view is, how can you tell a child about uh, abortion without giving a value judgment in there you know thou shalt not kill what yeah. if the child says to you is it okay to kill another so i'm, I'm kind of going around the circles here no, but i'm trying you. to sort of give you a view as to all of these issues came to the forefront but i suppose that the key point was the anti-pedophilia parents do not want their young children sexualized um tatcha was very much for lowering the age of consent this was out in the public domain um so they they uh protested to Together. Less than a week later, um, John Connors issues a 180 degree turn. You can draw your own conclusions as to why he would have done that. I, for one, am very disappointed that he did, but obviously he had his reasons. Um, I want to sort of say that the people I know involved in this are no more homophobic than the man in the moon. This is purely um, an anti-paedophilia, pro-child policy and pro-child movement. And to confound um, homophobia with being anti-paedophilia, I think is very disingenuous, disingenuous and does more harm to the LGBT movement. And I know a lot of gay people who would say to me, I want nothing to do with this. You know, I do not want to be sullied with this paedophile agenda such as it is. And as you, I don't know whether your viewers would agree or not, but if you're trying to chip away at the age of consent and hammer home this idea of consent, this to me, at least, is a Trojan horse for, um, you know, preying on younger children by, by adults. And this is the fear that we all have. Can I just and read what, uh, just let, what let, me read, let me read what Tatchell said. Um, Tatchell. Yeah. Tatchell said, I believe the age of consent should remain at 16, but consenting sex involving teens under 16 shouldn't be prosecuted, providing there is no more than two or three years difference in their ages. This is the law in Germany, Switzerland and Israel. It means consensual sex between persons aged 14 and 15 is not prosecuted, but sex between a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old would be. Now, what's interesting about that is, and I mentioned this to you today, when yeah. well, I was doing a TV show in London, and on the opening night of the launch of that station, I was encouraged to robustly go after Tatchell about the letter to The Guardian and his opinions. And at the time, he maintained that very thing. He said that he was more concerned about youngsters not being prosecuted. Now, at the time, I said to him, why is that any concern of yours? I'm not aware of any prosecutions of children who've had sex when they were 14 or 15 and your law will somehow open the door to older people having sex with children and he maintained to the death of that interview that I was wrong that he doesn't uh, at all condone sex between adults and children now mm -hmm. I've interviewed him three or four times since but it's usually been about transgender issues and drag queen story time and this stuff and we've had robust exchanges this hasn't come up again and I'm not talking behind his back because I will be in touch with him to give him right a reply. But I think over the years, he's not done enough himself, I don't think, to distance himself from people that are all over the lowering of the age of consent. And I'm not thrilled about that. So, so mm. I, 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 would, I would be like you. I would have a very... I mean, what I like about reading you is that you take a very broad view and a very rational view of everything. I like to think I do as well. I think people in Ireland who were concerned about O'Gorman... Um, you know, hanging around with Peter Tatchell. I think their concerns were legitimate, I think. And I also think, and I'm being told, um, uh, Fiona, that himself, uh, Roderick O'Gorman, some of his tweets have been a bit questionable over the years, even before he became children's minister. Tweets that you wouldn't find yourself tweeting out, you know, yourself, mm. like, you know, rational people. So, so I'm going to yeah. say you've got a genuine concern there, I think. Oh, yes. I, I mean, we do, you know, no disrespect to him or his abilities or his qualifications, but you've got to, you know, the picture has been painted and parents are concerned and they have every right to be concerned. And the government has a duty to address those concerns. You know, um, on the Tatchell question, you know, yes, of course, he objected sort of vigorously to any claim that he was in favour of X, Y or Z. But as you say, a cursory look at the man's history, you know, would suggest 
that his position now is questionable at best. Um, you know, I, for one, and, and I'll say it, you know, I'm saying it publicly, I find him very, very sinister and very, very worrying. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there or videos of the man um, publicly available where he is almost endorsing um, removing parents from even having any say in what education their children receive yeah. regarding relationships and sex ed. I mean, he even said on Niall Boylan here in Ireland that um, children children are not the property of parents. That's right. Yeah. And you know when you when you are openly advocating this and the movement um educate together I know there's from the UK are coming over to Ireland and basically giving them techniques on how to avoid having conversations with parents at all and literally making it as difficult as possible for those parents who would have objections to LGBTQ+ plus, and I'm I'm talking about the Q+ plus angle on it predominantly um worries about that They're making it as hard as possible for them to remove their children from those classes. And they're almost celebrating this fact together. So I think people in Ireland, I mean, I, you know, from what I can gather, took this opportunity to say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? To look at the RSE programme, to look into Tatchell, to look at O'Gorman and his previous tweets. You know, I'm not saying yeah or nay, I'm not accusing the man of anything. But the, the picture it paints is one of a huge concern to me, but the government just uses a strong arm tactics of sh silencing. You're all homophobes. Yeah, labelling us all homophobes. I mean, mm. for goodness sake, that's just so lame. That's just so tiresome. Tried and tested. It's almost boring at this stage. Hey, let me um, let me just jump in very quickly, Fiona, right. and um, and just provide a little bit of balance on Tatchell. I mean, if Tatchell is yeah. only Tatchell himself knows what he really is, he's got to look at himself in the mirror every night before he goes to bed. And I'm, I, I, you know, I, I've taken him on. It's, it's been six years, seven years since I took him on, on the whole age of consent thing. Since then, arguing with him about various things. The last time he was on, I had a big um, debate with him. He said it's not okay to think. I was saying to him, you've got to learn to live with people who don't like um, you because of your sexuality. I was basically saying, tough shit, Paddy. This is the world we live in. You know, there are people who don't like me because I'm Irish. There are people who don't like my friend uh, in, in Chief Mill because he's Jewish. Uh, you can't police thoughts. And incredibly, he was challenging that and suggesting that we should be able to police thoughts. Anyway, long yeah. story short, um, he does have questions maybe to ask about this obsession with sex education and obsession with maybe the age of consent and decriminalisation. And maybe I'll invite him back on again. And I know, I know he will come on. He, he, he's, not, he, he's, he's no shrinking violet. But over the years, um, the guy's put some stuff in the bank. He's done a lot, particularly back in the day when gay men and women used to have the bejesus booted out of them um, mm -hmm. just because they were going out. And he was brave and he got his head kicked in a hundred times and he stuck up for people, for women in, in Saudi Arabia. The, the guy's done some good stuff and I think he's genuine. But I hear you. These are important things. Let's stay with the religious sex education. Excuse me, the relationship and sex education. It's disgusting. It's distressing. It's horrendous as a non-parent to imagine that they would ask your child to consider these things at such a young age. Tell me, Fiona, where is your church on this in 2020? Are they absent completely? Absent completely, I'm afraid. Um, you know, I am I am late to the faith, as I say. I'm a sort of a reformed Catholic, if you like. I've I've done the scenic route through everything, yeah. but you know, of the of the last few years, I have I have gone back to it. It has been a source of great comfort to me. And at this time, I mean, thankfully, my children are now you know late teens, and so and I was blind through their sex education. So you know, thankfully, it was okay. It it never went to this sort of level um and yes our church has been absent because i mean just just cut a long story short it is very much it has handed over power completely to our secular state and it will not interfere it didn't even interfere in the abortion debate or it barely said a word you know um I, i'm not going to go down you know obviously you don't want to sort of get into this in too much detail but i'm very disappointed in pope francis i'll say this publicly you know we're getting no support at all from the catholic hierarchy in Ireland. So battered and bruised are they because of the child sex abuse scandals that they have been involved in themselves, that it's almost that they have retreated into the background, defeated, defeated and out of 
of the public view completely. And any time I go to battle with anybody about this, what is the first thing I always get back to me? How can you support yeah. the Catholic Church after all the children? Church, church, church? And of course, I, I condemn uh, child sex abuse at any level, in any aspect or area of society. But I do not condemn, condemn the teachings of Jesus Christ or the traditional scriptures of the Catholic Church. They, they hold still. But people associate one with the other and can't disentangle them. So it's almost that you're marred um, from the get go when you try and um, speak out on this because they go straight to your Twitter profile and say, ah, you're a Catholic. Yeah. So how can you possibly da 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 da? And then, then they're off. So, no, sadly, uh, Richie, to get back to your point, they have been um, missing in action. It's. You know what's happening here as well, and they're introducing weird games for children to play with oh. dice, and on each side of the dice would be a sexual act, or a or or, or a part of the body, and the child will have to describe an act and all this. If I didn't know it was going on, I would think the person telling me is just bat shite crazy. They've gone mad. This can't be going on, and yet it is. And this notion that. I mean, I'm 45, I did sex education. I had to be 14 when I was hearing the terms, you know, vagina and womb and egg and vulva. And this is how it happens. Biology, of course, it was all very, it was all very uh, clinical and uh, m <laughs> yes. mildly amusing, of course, as it was. Because when you're a teenager, you didn't know where to put your face. But the notion that we would have been dealing with this at four or five. What about parents? I, I know things are very difficult for people. I know... In most uh, households, both mum and dad, if mum and dad are there uh, to begin with, are working to make ends meet. So maybe it's easier to just let the schools get on with it. But I would hope in my heart of hearts that parents would say, no, you don't talk to our children about this. They're too young. They should be rolling around in the muck, eating snails, playing marbles, running around, kicking a ball. They can't be asked to consider this stuff at that age. Are parents worried about this? Are they kicking off or are the majority just resigned to it? I think the latter, Richie, I'm sad to say. Um, the reason I say that to you is a very good friend of mine is a deputy head teacher of a primary school. And we we actually came to blows on this whole issue last summer together. No this was actually before the, the RSE had crystallized from the World Health Organization. And her view to me was, you know, parents just dump their kids at the school gates and run off to work. Just like you said, they're so harassed and harangued to pay the mortgage, to hold down the jobs, that it's almost like they do leave everything up to the school and they trust the school curriculum in doing this. Um, I was also told that children are turning up at school quite sexualized already in the sense that they are, you know, doing inappropriate things. So the view of the, some of the teachers, and again, I'm just giving you my little anecdotal evidence here, is that, yes, of course, we should be more factual with them but in my in the in defense of my friend i don't believe that she would be fully on board with what's going on now because obviously things came down from the world health organization in the interim and the schools are now being primed to deliver this as and when they uh, resume you know with the covid nonsense so you know i actually think that the only groups of parents who are concerned are those of faith and i'm talking about any faith in this country yeah. um and and that's just my my sense of it. Now I pray, I hope I'm wrong, um, but I, I sense the majority will go along with it. Just like when there was drag queen story time going on here over a year ago, um, some people on Twitter picked up on this. Of course, they were uh, told they were bigots and homophobes and everything. But you know, come on, um, it took a drag queen to come out and say, "What are you parents doing, letting adult entertainers have access to yeah. your young children in a?" A library story story setting an actual drag queen themselves came out and said this and said you're not doing us any good either because we do what we do you know in, in in nighttime shows adult shows fine whatever get on with it enjoy yourself but by by giving your kids access to us you're actually shining a spotlight on us as well so it's you know a crazy situation and can i just sort of emphasize what i am personally more concerned about on the queer theory all of this um has brought my attention to aspects of queer theory and um there is a, a, a 
an an analyst called Sarah Beresford, and what she has said about queer theory is this, and I think it's worth um, emphasising. The term queer is by definition whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate and the dominant, okay, and aims to destabilise dominant ideas of identity, whether that identity is sexual, gendered, ethnic, national and political and so forth. It sounds liberating, but actually it includes the idea that adults, the dominant at the moment includes the idea that adults should not sexually abuse children. What she's saying is that unnervingly, the reframing of child sex abuse and liberating of paedophilia from the margins of society, she believes, is a dominant idea within queer theory. So what I'm saying to you, I'm suggesting to you and your listeners that the whole area of queer theory, and apparently the grandfather of queer theory was the French philosopher Michel Foucault, who was a deviant degenerate. Um, you've got to look in deeper into this because they're trying to break down all societal norms and all boundaries, which I believe will inevitably include those boundaries of consent between adult and child. We are potentially opening the door for a Trojan horse of normalizing paedophilia in society through the Q plus, the queer theory. So this is out, outside of the LGBT issue. You know what, you uh, Fiona, my my uh, friend and colleague Hayden Hewitt of LiveLeak.com fame, he's doing a lot of looking into this as well. And at the moment, Twitter seems to be very comfortable with making space for people who describe themselves as minor attracted persons. And it yeah. seems to be legitimising them. Now look, everybody is a human being, no matter what you've done. Uh, no matter what your crime is, you, you know, you, we, we still have to live with people. We might have to lock them up. We might have to monitor them, of course. But um, to be to be kind of painting them as some sort of victim, uh, which 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 is what he's looking into, and that's kind of seg- that that kind of neatly aligns with what you've just told me there. We might do more on that in the future. I'm looking at the clock now. It's twenty eight and a half minutes past the hour. Fiona Marie Flanagan is our guest. It's flying by, and uh, you should be following Fiona on Twitter if you're on Twitter. It's at Fiona M. Flanagan 1. It's at Fiona M. M for mother Flanagan 1. Great name. My mother's uh, maiden name is Flanagan. I'm a Flanagan. Should be Richie Flanagan, really, but it doesn't sound you as good. You should. Richie Allen is more, uh, it's more DJ-ish. Uh, Richie <laughs> Allen. Flanagan is a great name. Now, um, we are going to talk a bit about recent papers which show that 5G technology might have an effect on people, might be somehow linked to uh, coronavirus. I'm open-minded to that. We'll do that in a minute. Uh, but I know, Fiona, I can't not ask you, uh, Dublin uh, lady, uh, one of our own, you're in Ireland. Um, how, if I'd have said to you a few months ago, hey, Fiona, in July of this summer, you won't be taking holidays, or if you do, it's going to be very difficult. You won't be going to nightclubs. You won't be going here or there. You'll have to socially distance. You'll be told you need to be wearing a mask in shops, and it's all because there's a bit of a virus going around. I'm guessing a few weeks ago or a few months ago, you would have said, Richie, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, son. Um, how do you feel about what's been happening and what, what, what this reality we're in now, how do you deal with it? How do you cope with it? Um, oh, my goodness, Richie, what can I say? Um, I'll just roll back a little bit on that and say I knew there was a crisis coming. And I'm not saying I'm Mystic Meg or anything like that, but it's just I, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis and I was watching the economy specifically because I used to teach economics and I was fully prepared for a, another financial crisis, Mark II, um, with, with, which may have been precipitated by a world war or something. So I was kind of on the hot seat, you know, a bit trigger happy thinking, goodness, something is going to come, but I don't know what it is. And um, because, again, I was looking at the markets, just looking at the economies, etc. I would never have imagined that a virus like this would have happened or been used as the trigger for what is going on now. I, so to answer your question, yeah, I would have told you you're crazy. Yeah. And it's almost like my worst nightmares are coming true here because this virus is the catalyst for everything. It's almost as if all the... Now, I'm very much into the research on the United Nations Agenda 2030, Sustainable Development Goals, into the climate change agenda, etc., which has been very much to the forefront of over the last couple of years. And what I see is that this virus is the 
catalyst for all of these agenda items to converge and they're all converging now and the measures that are being imposed upon us in Ireland here, and I was just listening to your previous guest um, in the UK, they're all being done, Richie, in lockstep globally. Yeah. And I have only recently discovered that all countries who are members of the UN have previously signed a binding international health regulations treaty with the UN World Health Organization, because the WHO is is part, it's affiliated with the United Nations, which is binding and supersedes every national uh, protocol or rule or mandate in the situation of global pandemics. So what we are seeing happen in the UK, as crazy as it is, or in Ireland or anywhere else, has been mandated from the World Health Organization down into all our countries. And they have no choice but to comply because they have already signed signed up to this these international health regulations mandated by the World Health Organization. So Richie, I am I'm just because I I've, I've looked into the documents, I've looked into the Rockefeller um, lockstep scenario planning that was put out in 2010. I've looked into the Rockefeller co um, contact tracing. I've looked ahead at climate action plans. Um, I'm looking at you know what Bill Gates is saying, and I'm 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 suggesting to you my proposition is that we are in a permanent COVID world. So the fact that we are being mandated to wear face masks masks does not surprise me sadly and it's not I'm not saying I told you so or I'm great or anything like it I wish I was wrong but it is in that Rockefeller document yeah, it, is. it is it is actually there that mandated face masks are going to come in so all we all that is happening as far as I can see is we're all being conditioned you know like um like you know the UK column has gone through and explained how the behavioral insights team is working in the UK with government and the SAGE report to basically psychologically condition the UK population through fear. And that's been and in that's the mainstream media. Happening. The amazing thing about that is those, th that information has been disseminated in the UK broadsheet media. That's the thing that really cheeses me off more than anything. Yes, some of us in the independent media have talked about it, um, but staggeringly in the obviously much wider mainstream media, which reaches far more... Um, readers and, and listeners, they, they basically discuss this stuff and yet nothing comes of it. It's like people read it, Fiona, and it doesn't register with them what's going on. And I can't get my head around that. It's hard to though, Richie, you know what? I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I share your frustration, obviously, but it, it's almost like it's incomprehensible. You know how, um, we, you know, when you talk about the new world order, and that's probably raises the hackles of some of your listeners, but it's actually true. It's out there in the literature. I mean, even our previous Pope, um, God rest his soul, was talking about it. So it's not as if it is a conspiracy. I only wish it was. It's a conspiracy fact. Um, so, you know, when you're talking talking about this and you're talking about the United Nations and I, I understand um, and I'm very, very upset about it. The reason it was created, the mandate it always had was for global governance. That was its objective. And the, the government, the governance system was going to be sort of communist slash communitarian. This is this is its ethos. Its ethos is communist. Um, it was sort of the, the blueprint was drawn up by Stalin or Lenin. It was firmed up by Stalin and then it was amended by Khrushchev. These are facts. You know, I, I wish they weren't. So the fact that you have a communist World Health Organization pushing down totalitarian mandates on countries that are um, they're actually an abuse of our human rights I believe I believe they are um, you know yeah crimes against humanity what they are and can I can, I can I just say this Fiona for listeners who might be new to this information um, beginning to do these shows back in the late 2000s and meeting people like Jim Mars and and David Icke they mm -hmm. used to talk a lot about the round table groups which are Rockefeller Foundation groups like the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the United Nations, the Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome. All of these yeah. groups are think tanks. And it's out of these groups that come the agenda that Fiona has just been describing. And it's out of these groups that politicians get their marching orders. And that's not conspiracy theory, that's a fact. And these documents that Fiona referenced from 2010, 
Uh, we had Harry Vox on the show recently. He discovered his stuff back in 2014. It's all true. None of this is a knee-jerk reaction to a sudden virus. It's been planned for years. And, yeah. and, and, and because it's been planned for years, the, Fiona has been projecting where it is going. Because it's been planned for years, we can see where it's going. And Fiona, you just said it. You can say it again. Mandated vaccines for everybody and a new yeah. system of social crediting, right? Oh, yes. Yes. And worse, Richie. It's worse. It's even worse than that. And I'm sorry to be black pilling or red pilling or whatever you want to call your audience. But what, when, what's happening now, you will see more and more is the climate action plans that our governments again have signed up to. And if what if what you should do is go to your Google or your DuckDuckGo or whatever search engine you use and type in climate action plan and your local council area and you will see your local climate action action plan. If you dig into that document, you should see that it refers to the um, sort of chain of command. And it shows you because I've done my own, I've seen what it's it's about. It shows you that it comes through the United Nations down through the EU, and, and it would have done for Britain when Britain was a member, and um, then down into your sort of overall government, and then it gets disseminated down to the local councils. So it is a global totalitarian push. And what they're are saying now is that COVID will be the vaccine for climate change, yeah. if you see what I mean. So all the measures to mitigate COVID will be used then and taken forward to address the issues of our time, which is climate change or man-made, human-driven CO2 climate change. So what you're seeing now emerge in the media is they're talking about, you know, biodiversity and this sort of transmission of viruses from animals to humans, because it's all our fault, because we're ruining our environment. Our very existence is a pollutant on the planet. So you blame humanity. We are the cause of these viruses being transmitted from animals to humans. So what we need to do is move forwards and ensure areas of biodiversity. And that's what you're going to have. You're going to have sections of the countryside uh, cordoned off and sealed off, never to be accessed again. Um, you're also going to see, as you said, the vaccine is going to be mandated. That will roll in a system of uh, surveillance, control, ultimately universal basic income and ultimately tied to social credit. How they will do that, the you know, the steps they will take to do it, I obviously can't say for sure. You know, we can see how this evolves. But in tandem with that will be the climate action plan to reduce our carbon footprint, each and every one of us. Um, and I've even seen that Al Gore has come out now to say that using artificial intelligence, what they're trying to going to try and do is actually track CO2 emissions down to the individual. So they will look at you, Richie, and say, OK, how much energy have you used? How much yeah. water have you used? How much electricity? And, you know, along with this, you're going to be we all of us globally are going to be rationed. Now, I haven't even begun to talk about the Great Reset. So if you go on to the World Economic Forum, your listeners, and you will see the Great Reset in lights there. If you go into the COVID response or COVID action plans, you're going to see layers upon layers of planning that went live just after COVID was declared a pandemic. And that discusses Great Reset and all the plans that they have in place. And they mean it. This is their great push to bring in their global system of governance and that includes however they engineer it a global currency global as i say go, global government which will filter down and i believe now this is again is just me surmising that we will end up having a kind of a mayoral system in our regions which will and they will just sort of implement the diktats of the global government. So we won't have government nationally anymore. We will be under governance. So therefore, I posit to you, Richie, that Boris Johnson, that our new Hall Martin, they're puppets. They're just doing what they're told. And in fairness to Boris, you know, not that I can say with any degree of certainty, but it looked to me from the outset that he was very uncomfortable with what he was having to oh, do. Oh, from the word go, UK. yeah. Oh, when they announced yeah. the lockdown, I, I said on this very show, when, when, when he announced the lockdown, I said he looked like a guy that was under um, severe duress. He looked like somebody that was we couldn't see the person but off camera there was a guy with a gun pointed at he said 
Oh, yeah. To me, that's how it looked, yeah. that It was yeah. dawning on and him, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I believe that too. Because honestly, you know, in, in so far as these people have been groomed and put into place and they're, they've all signed up to the globalist agenda because they have to, otherwise they would be removed, Richie. You know, and I, I don't know whether you have said or somebody has said that Keir Starmer, when he comes, will be worse. And I believe so. I believe he's waiting in the wings to come and push this through further and to really cement the, the agenda home. That's a very good but, point, no, as as Blair continued the policies of Margaret Thatcher, but 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 on steroids, yes, yeah. I can see that happening. I think it's inevitable that Starmer will win the next election. I think that's been decided already, and these things that you've been talking about and uh, will happen. I have this nightmare, and I mentioned it on the show weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Actually, before the COVID thing, before the COVID yeah. thing, I suggested that in the near future. I mean, you brilliantly described social crediting in terms of our houses will soon basically be smart houses. They will be. And every device in those houses will be communicating and sending signals to a local hub. And through that local hub, they will know if you've got red meat in the fridge, well, you've got too much. If you're eating too much of the wrong stuff, as you said, if you're using too much electricity or too much water, you might find your social credit score will drop as a result of this. But I had this um, idea in my head that it won't be too long that um, I live on a street, I'm on the odd number side of the street, right? So I'm on mm-hmm. the 379 side of the street. It won't be too long before it'll be, right, uh, this side of the street can take their cars out on the weekend this week, but not mm-hmm. next week. Next week it'll be across the road. And I said to you off air today, a lot of people on telly today and yesterday saying, it's so clean, it's so wonderful, it smells so nice, the air is so good because of the lockdown. We need to keep some of these measures uh, these planetary saving measures in the near future. I think you're on to something. I do want to say, though, it's 17 minutes at the top of the air. We're going to go for another uh, 13 or 14 minutes. This global action plan, this Rockefeller Foundation stuff that you are hearing from Fiona Marie Flanagan, it is all true. It's not conspiracy theory. It's not the imaginings of a, a bright academic who's lost the run of herself. It's a <laughs> fact. And, you know, your academic background is really, really useful. As a researcher, it's great to have somebody like you with the academic background to look at this stuff, to disseminate it, to analyse it and to talk about it. I want to use some of the time we have left. um, And there there are times when I would go over uh, because I can do whatever I bloody want on on, on this radio programme. We could go beyond seven. But for um, reasons I can't get into today, we can't do that. But we will have you back on ASAP to continue this. But in the time we have left, I do want to get into that paper that you tweeted today about 5G and coronavirus, if you don't mind, uh, Fiona, uh, no, because no, it's important no, as well. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Tell us about this paper, which, which, which is peer reviewed and it is by legitimate and qualified um, men who've looked into this. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, you know, just to sort of say that I have. OK, let, let, let me roll back a second. I, I, I subscribe to the view that EMFs, the have an adverse effect on um, biological organisms, i.e. humans and animals. I believe this to be fact. If you go on to the PubMed peer-reviewed literature, you will see that it's there. Um, Dr. Sharon Goldberg is a very, very good source on YouTube if anyone is looking and she has given um, a deposition and she has explained. So, you know, originally I was very, very, I was interested, but but it was almost like I didn't want to know, Richie. Yeah. Because, you know, when you think, oh, everything is toxic, and I love tech. I mean, you know, I've always enjoyed tech. And I was the last person who wanted to think that this could be damaging to us. So, you know, as as this went on, okay, so so therefore I'm suggesting to people, and I, what I'm saying is we're not all the same. We all have um, different propensities, different biological makeup. So we'll all be affected in different ways. Some of us may not even be affected at all. But once the COVID, the virus struck, and I was I was privileged enough to be able to talk to Professor Dolores Cahill, and I actually, together with Rowan Croft, and you may know Rowan, um, we both interviewed her when she started to speak out. Very about good the virus. interview, now, that. Very good, very important interview, that, yeah. 
it was I I was so stressed about it because you know yes and she's she's gone on and she's gone public and we are so grateful to her over this you know she's basically uh critiqued the lockdown so to get back but but she didn't go obviously she didn't go into 5g but this has been something that has concerned me and independently I've been doing research as to the the key 5g frequencies you know the 60 gigahertz frequency which is supposed to be um interfere with oxygen oxygen yeah. absorption and it's supposed to destabilize oxygen molecules which makes it harder to bind to your hemoglobin and therefore transport around your body so i've been going into that and what also pricked, perked my attention as well was i thought to myself why are they rolling out 5g when we were in lockdown because this was reported on pretty much globally and i say to you that 5g technology is absolutely fundamental as you have said too to the internet of things to the smart city to the smart grids, to monitoring and surveilling each one of us and our energy consumption, to our electric vehicles, because Richie, as much as you'd like to be even given the odd side of the street to drive your car, yeah. let me tell you, you're not going to have a car. You're going to, A, then you're going to have to have an electric vehicle. And even after that, you won't be able to have a car because we'll all be on the universal basic income. We're not going to be able to afford any and they're not going to permit us to drive it. But that's 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 another story. That's down the tracks. I think they're, they're sort of dead line for that is 2030. So anyway, 5G is integral and they have not done any independent studies as to its safety. So the precautionary principle should apply. So uh, unless and until it is proven safe. But of course, they, they shut down any conversation. And if you approach your local councillors, you will get all the obfuscation in the world on this, which I have done, too. So anyway, back to the point. Um, it occurred to me, and for personal reasons too, because I, you know, like you, but I was way worse, I suffered a health crash um, a year and a half ago where I collapsed, unable to breathe out of the blue. It took me out of academia and it took me out of the theology course I was doing. And I would then put, I went into convalescence. And it's almost as if this COVID thing and the characteristics of this virus have sort of triggered in me a, a research angle to look at EMFs and how they interfere with viruses. And there is existing research which suggests that electromagnetic frequencies, and we're talking about, you know, again, 2G, 3G, G, 4G, can activate a, a viral response within your body and it can almost activate viruses that are lying dormant there for example the Epstein-Barr virus which was activated in me so with this 5G Wuhan now I am naturally uh, skeptical of anything coming out of China sorry to say so I, I wasn't buying the collapsing story even then but recently um, research is emerging that these 5G frequencies are especially dangerous and that they could interact with this COVID-19 or, more importantly, vaccines for COVID-19, Richie, and trigger an immune response that it's almost like um, a cytokine storm, which is as Professor Dolores Cahill described it. Now, she didn't describe it in relation to 5G. I have to say, I haven't spoken to her about that. But research is suggesting that there is a correlation that is worth exploring in more detail. And again, they're doing some mapping. And again, I'm not saying that this is this is, you know, anything to sort of hammer home. But there is there does appear to be a link between 5G rollouts and very severe incidences of COVID-19. Now, I am beginning to think and it's that there may be different strains of this darn thing already, Richie. You know, because the thing mutates, viruses mutate. So we could very well be dealing with a pathogen that has different strains around the world, because I do know someone who's in the Middle East and who had COVID and who had a particularly nasty form of it. And actually, I know two people in the Middle East who've had this a nasty form of it. So I'm, you know, and 5G is very, very active in the country that they reside in. Anyway, so this this research does suggest that these frequencies activate a viral response within us and that we should be very, very concerned about any vaccine that we are mandated to take 
and what that will do. Now, again, I'm not saying it's going to keel us over, but we need to be mindful that it could weaken us and that even a, a recovery from COVID-19 in the presence of an environment that's increasingly radiated may very well uh, mean we get recurrences. Isn't so that this interesting is now? This, this, is, this is interesting because obviously this week and last week, the UK government started doing interviews and began to talk about their new discovery that COVID was having a very long effect in people that seemingly had recovered. So they said, don't think you'll get over COVID. They said, we're finding people later on who've got heart issues, uh, they, they've got lung issues, they've got kidney issues, they've got brain issues, all this stuff. And my other half who doesn't get involved in the show um, is interested from time to time, but has her own life. She was sitting there and out of the blue, she said, they're getting their excuses in early about mm. what about what uh, 5G will mean for people when it is rolled out everywhere. And I looked at her and I thought, yeah, that's a very smart thing to say. No pun intended. That's a very bright thing to say. That that, that, that would make sense, wouldn't it? You start talking yeah. about these things yeah. now. And then, of course, people begin to experience them. It might be because of their exposure to uh, 5G radio waves. But it's easy to say, oh, no, it's actually the delayed after effects of COVID, like we told you six months ago. Wow, yeah. this is where we yeah, are. Yeah, you see, and it's impossible to prove, Richie. You know, we're sitting here, but I think we're doing the right thing by looking at all environmental factors that we yeah. are exposed to, because it would be a dereliction not to. You know, I, you know, I, I can't understand. I mean, as much as I don't want to acknowledge it, but I still feel that it's incumbent upon people to consider these factors. And as I said, not all of us are going to react in the same way. So we have to be mindful of this. And the thing that really worries me is given that we have the research there already, it's not even open for debate, according to no. Dr. Sharon Goldberg, about the effects of EMFs more generally on um, human uh, biological organisms. What about children? Are they rolling 5G out in school situations? Do they have 5G operationalized in hospitals already? Are they activating those ventil ventilators that they're putting people on? We need to ask these questions. We need to understand where this technology is actually being rolled out and activated because the stock response I get from the 5G advocates is, oh, you're a, you're a conspiracy loon yeah, ball yeah. because you're going on about it's not six 60 gigahertz, this, this magical frequency. And it may not be, Richie, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that it's not on any other one of the, you know, absolutely the right, ionizing Fiona. or the water molecule destroying 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz frequencies. So it's all kind of deflection. And, you know, if they prove you wrong on one point, they say, oh, you're just, you're a tinfoil nut job. So you're not worth even talking to. Look at you with your 5G nonsense. So we're, we're in very, very dangerous territory. And the fact that you're even speaking about this is to your credit, because any time I tweet with 5G and COVID in the one tweet, I automatically get a warning. Do, oh, you get it a warning now, do you? Yeah. yeah well, it sends th me on Twitter. It's yeah. funny that, th I mean, th this program, I've been speaking to people like Ole Johansson in Sweden, Chris Busby, uh, going back years and years and years. We've been, um, not we, because I'm just a presenter, I'm just a journalist, but my guests for years now have been raising the alarm about this. It's getting traction now because now it's happening. But you made a very good point. Non-ionising radiation, EMF, have been, um, have represented serious problems for human health for years. We, the evidence is all there. And, and as for 5G, there are hundreds of peer-reviewed papers saying that to not properly test this is a travesty and that it will be, uh, it will have a huge impact on people. Again, only weeks ago, Busby was on this programme saying that it's going to be catastrophic for uh, human health and particularly for the health of, uh, of children. We've got about 90 seconds left on the programme today. Fiona is on Twitter. It's at Fiona M Flanagan 1, at Fiona M Flanagan 1. Next time you come back on, um, hopefully in early August, you might come back on when you have a bit of time. We'll do a bit longer to give us more time to flesh out more of the things we didn't get to uh, get into tonight, but we covered quite a lot as well. Um, great to see you um, involved, Fiona. Great to see you putting information in the public domain in a very succinct and a very, um, I would say, cerebral and very professional way. You know, it's, it really is very good and, and important. 
And I'll give you the final word, by the way. So we've got about 60 seconds left. Final word to you. Thanks for giving us your time today. I've enjoyed having you and I hope you'll come back. Final word to you, Fiona Marie Flanagan. Form networks of like-minded people who can help you out so you can help each other out when we go into full-on lockdown in the autumn winter. I'm very worried about what's coming down the tracks, everybody. I wish I wasn't. And you know what? If I'm wrong, I will sit here happily and say I was, you know, I got it all wrong. I, I pray to God I'm wrong, but plan for the worst. Brilliant, Fiona. Again, sincere thanks for your time today. I didn't give you a lot of time. Um, in terms of, um, I didn't give you much notice. So lovely that you you came on today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Richie. And keep up your great advocacy and your great work as well. And please, God, we can talk, you know, in the not too distant future. It'll be very soon, Fiona. Thanks a lot. God bless. Uh, uh, That was um, Fiona Marie Flanagan. It's uh, Fiona Marie, it's Fiona M Flanagan 1 on Twitter. Check Fiona M Flanagan 1 on Twitter to follow her uh, there. And if you put her name into YouTube, you will find the interviews that she did with uh, Professor Dolores Cahill, Cahill, Cahill we say in Ireland, Cahill you say in Philistine country. Um, uh, I tried to get uh, Professor Dolores Cahill on the programme. She didn't want to come on this programme. I think it might have been because of the backlash that she'd received in the Irish press. That's fair enough. We don't hold that against anybody. Thanks so much to Simon Dolan in Hour 1. Again, thanks to Fiona. Thanks to you for listening. Do enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. I'm back tomorrow. Richard Willett, the filmmaker, is back on this programme after a long time. Uh, He's uh, recently released a film which is very, very interesting. I'm looking forward to speaking with him. I will have another guest as well. That'll be Thursday. Take care of yourselves and one another. Leaving you with (laughs) Oriem. Bye now. (laughs) 